Hello and welcome! After those many struggles to repair this packet bell machine, I guess I owe you a completed build and a tour. I finished it already some time ago, but unfortunately had no time to make a video. And today I would like to catch up and show you what else happened to this little packet bell. As you maybe remember, the machine was not only very dusty, but the leaky battery damaged the mainboard heavily. That was a long journey, but I was able to revive it, I even reverse engineered the turbo functionality and restored a damaged IC. If you missed that part, feel free to take a look, that was quite exciting. After the mainboard was fixed, it was time to take a look at the case. I pretty much like it, because it is so compact and though has a place for CD-ROM and a floppy drive, though the plastic front was very yellowed. First of all, I took care of the PSU. Inside it was very dusty and the fan looked extremely dirty, so I cleaned everything and oiled the fan. The capacitors in the PCU looked all fine. After the PCU was clean, it was time to test it. Remember always to test your PCU with at least some load. I usually use a defective hard drive for this purpose. The PCU was unfortunately still quite loud. The fan works well, but should probably be replaced with something more silent. But at least the voltage looked ok, 4 plus minus 12 volt, I got around 11.7, and for plus minus 5 volt I got about 5.2, which is slightly high, but with more load it would drop a bit, so I consider it good enough. Then it was time to take care of the front panel. As I said, it was very yellow and quite dirty. The sticker on the front said something about a refrigerator device, and I think this PC was used to control some kind of industrial device. And as I pulled off the sticker, it was visible how much the plastic yellowed over the years compared to the original color under the sticker.
Also, the CD-ROM drive looked really yellow. The volume wheel was not touched in decades and you can really see the difference to the other side, which was hidden from the sunlight. The CD-ROM drive is a Panasonic CR563B and it was made before IDE became standard for the CD-ROM drives. I was hoping that it would work or could be repaired because it is quite rare and expensive today since it was not only distributed with Creative Sound Blaster cards, but also used in the Panasonic 3DO game consoles. This drive is not the best from the technical point of view, but it is very interesting historically. If you never disassembled a CD-ROM drive, first of all you need to push with a paper clip or something similar into a hole to release the caddy. After that, you can turn around the drive and push the front cover slightly forward and up like this. But be careful and don't break the standoffs. I needed to disassemble the drive further because I wanted to retrobrite the plastic parts. On this drive there are two screws hidden from inside left and right from the caddy. Once those screws are removed, the metal enclosure can be pushed away and the front part can be easily taken off. And once again you can see how yellow it became over the years. The drive itself looked good. The mechanical parts were all fine and even the old belt was still tight and in good shape. Not even much of the dust after so many years. Probably the drive never has been used. The floppy drive is also a Panasonic device and those are very reliable and silent. I like those. The front panel of it is great, but it had that visible yellow cast as well. So I decided to retrobrite it too. On this device the front panel can be easily removed without full disassembly. Still I decided to open it because it was very dirty and visibly dusty inside. To remove the cover you need to remove only two screws. The eject button can be also removed by lifting a small shackle deeper inside. I cleaned the drive from the dust and the read write heads were cleaned with some IPA too. And I also cleaned the mechanics and added fresh silicon grease. I could directly put back the cover on since the front panel can be attached later as is. After all the plastic parts were taken off, it was time to clean everything with some IPA and prepare it for retro writing. Unfortunately, the case front had some silver stains, probably paint or permanent marker, which I couldn't remove. I tried various chemicals, even benzene, but nothing worked, so I had to leave it as is. After that, it was time to cover everything with 12% hydrogen peroxide for retro writing. It's better to use it as liquid, but I only have it as gel. To distribute it over the surface, I usually use a brush. I already told many times on this channel that this is not a tutorial for anything. So never ever do this without wearing gloves, like I do. Since peroxide is an acid and it will definitely burn your skin. I don't wear gloves because I'm lazy. Um, I mean, I do it for the signs. I will show you later what it means. After applying the peroxide evenly, the whole part has to be wrapped into a transparent foil and then the gel inside should be once again massaged for even distribution. It is very important, otherwise the brightening will be uneven resulting in so-called marbling effects with the yellow smears all over the place. 
For retro brighting, you need warm and sunny days. It took about 4 to 5 hours in direct sun and I came out every 20 minutes to move the peroxide gel to avoid the marbling effect. That's why it's better to use liquid than gel because you don't need to move the gel around. Just drop the parts into a transparent container with liquid hydrogen peroxide and take it out after a while. Much easier, but well, I used what I had with all the consequences. And here, by the way, why you shouldn't use hydrogen peroxide without gloss. Yes, this is burnt skin. It doesn't hurt, but feels a bit itchy and is most probably dangerous in the long term, especially if you do it more often. So please, don't be lazy like me and wear gloves. After washing and drying, the parts looked beautiful. The difference between the previously yellow plastic around the sticker was almost invisible now. Well, and the silvery scars unfortunately were still where they were. The front cover had one broken stand off and to fix that I used some plastic glue which is acetone based and is used for plastic models. As you see it melts the plastic a little bit and basically welds the parts together. The power button unfortunately remained a tiny bit more yellow than the rest. Maybe later I will give it some more sunbath. The metal case cover had some scratches but was quite clean. I could repaint it but decided to leave it as it was. The floppy drive looked as good as new after its sun bath. And look at the CD-ROM front panel color. It was almost brown before and after retro brighting it looked bright and shiny again. Just compare the color to the internal parts. Now they are the same. And here is one funny detail. I forgot to retro bright the volume knob, but I decided to leave it as it was as well. It's yellow only between volume 0 and 3, the part which was for years exposed to the light. If I turn the volume knob to volume 10, the yellow part disappears inside. I think this is a funny reminder which deserves to stay. And it was the time to finally put everything together. The optional modem was not installed in this machine and the cordon hole on the back of the case was just covered with a plastic clip.
If you followed this series of videos, maybe you remember that I had to fix the turbo mode on the mainboard. But at this point, that was done and the machine looked very nice. It was a long journey, but I was happy with the result. And it was finally time to take a look at the content of the original hard drive. I set up the hard drive according to the label on it to uh, 685 cylinders, 16 heads and 38 sectors with total size of warping 203 megabytes. Unfortunately, the machine refused to boot from the hard drive, so I used a Microsoft DOS installation diskette to boot into the system. It automatically started the setup, which I aborted and dropped into the command line. Here I could luckily switch to the drive C and list the directory. It was full with data and even Norton Commander was installed on the system. It was a PC from Germany, so obviously everything was in German. There were some private documents, Excel sheets and databases. That was not the point of my interest. I was searching for some useful tools, games and such things. There was uh, CL Utils, which is a video mode testing tool for the Cyrus Logic graphics chip, which was in this machine. So the hard drive was definitely the original one. Another interesting folder was Disk Imac, or Image, which contained all the original setup files, which were provided for this machine by the manufacturer. There were DOS 6.2 and Windows 3.1 installation files, drivers for the graphics and sound cards and more. I will come back to this directory in a minute. There was more software on the hard drive, but most of it was something usual like Norton Commander, Windows, works for Windows, etc. I don't want to bother you with that. As I said, there was a lot of private data which I will not broadcast, but one unusual program I would like to show you though. Among others, there was one directory named PPL, which contained a software PPLA tester with a fancy airplane flying into the screen. Down here is written that this software was used by Flugsportverein Celle, an aviation club in Celle, a city not far away from my hometown. I found this quite cool, but it didn't correlate with the sticker on the front, which I removed previously. That one told that something about industrial refrigerator device, and I don't know how that is connected to an aviation club. Well, it looked like the software was a test for ongoing pilots, with various questions in law, navigation, meteorology and more. Quite exciting, don't you think? Well, I wanted to back up the most interesting parts of the hard drive before formatting it and doing a clean installation. For that purpose, I used my usual way to transfer the data from and onto the machine, a network card. I have boot diskette which starts an FTP server and shares the access to the complete drive C. So I can access it over the network and copy the data from and to the machine. However, I pretty fast ran into endless I.O. errors and could not copy a lot of files. I validated that uh, the same files were not accessible directly on the PC as well and that had nothing to do with my network setup. So I copied from the hard drive as much as I could, formatted it and let Microsoft scan disk run over the surface to check it. Well, unfortunately it had a lot of bad sectors and I had to run it a couple of times until all bad blocks were isolated. Every run discovered more of them, but after a while it remained stable over multiple runs, so I could continue the setup. But I think that this hard drive has reached its lifetime expectations a long time ago. It still works, but I don't know how long yet. I continued my journey, installed Microsoft DOS 622 and wanted to install Windows 3.11. I could copy the files over the network, but it was a good opportunity to test the CD-ROM drive. Since I still have the original OEM Windows CD, which I got with my PC in the 90s. The CD-ROM drive, however, was still not connected. If you remember, although it has the same 40-pin IDE cable, it is not compatible with IDE and can be even damaged by connecting it to the wrong controller. So I installed the original sound card back in place, which has the required Panasonic CD-ROM controller. 
Once the drive was attached, it was only a question of setting up the drivers in DOS. This sound card works for sound without drivers. They are optional, but to be able to use the CD-ROM, an additional driver in config sys is required. The sound card setup application tells what has to be added into the config sys and autoexec part to make it work. It even adds the required lines automatically, but since I have custom configuration with boot menu, I needed to adjust it a bit. And after a reboot, I was glad to see that the CD-ROM drive works and the installation of Windows 4 Workgroups 3.11 went flawlessly. Even VGA drivers for the Cyrus Logic card and the drivers for the sound card, including various audio applications, went without any issues. Now let's come back to that disk image directory which was on the hard drive originally. As I said, that was the complete software set as delivered by Packard Bell for this machine originally. That included also the drivers which I needed for DOS and Windows. Unfortunately, majority of the files in that directory was corrupt due to the bad blocks on the hard drive. Of course, it wouldn't be a problem to get the drivers from the DOS Reloaded DE, Vogons or other well-known sources. But I also wanted to spend some more time with that OEM software and see what else could be found there. Luckily, after a bit of search, I could find the Accordant Packard Bell CD images on archive.org and fetch everything from there. That was quite exciting, especially because there was one directory named JP132, which contained only corrupted files on the hard drive. And thanks to the image which I fetched from archive.org, I could learn one game which I never played before. Don't ask me how that could happen, and you will probably laugh now, but I even didn't hear about it previously. Despite that the name of it is huge, especially in the 90s, it definitely was, and though I never heard of it. The game itself is not only not bad, it is even quite unique. You start near a crashed car in the dinosaur park with two types of guns. Some kind of projectile gun for range attack and limited ammo and electric bolt gun for near range attacks with unlimited automatic recharge. You have to fight against various enemies and mostly it works well, but the flies are annoying because you can't hit them as long as they are in the air. The plot in the game is inspired by the movie only partially, but is not the same. In the game you have to search for such terminals which tell you what to do or give you some hints. In the first level, for example, you have to search for Tim and Lex. Maybe you remember the kids from the movie. Tim is running in the wild and Lex is well hidden. First you have to unlock a bunker door using the terminal, which also tells you that you need an ID card to open the gate. So you run to the bunker to pick up some tools and of course you will be attacked by different creatures which get respawned all the time. After a while I found it annoying and started just to avoid the enemies where possible. The tools from the bunker can be used to cut the metal bars to get into the sewers where you can find the ID card which you will need to open the gate. And then one of the most annoying parts of the whole game starts, pushing the crate all over the whole map. By the way, there is no saving possible, you get attacked all the time also by invisible crocodiles in the water. Luckily you can hear them before they appear, but also the crate happens to stuck in the corner sometimes. All in all that was a pain in the back, but I was keen to see a little bit more of this game and managed it eventually to get the crate to Lex in the other corner of the map. The girl then crawls onto it and you have again push it completely back. I didn't like this part of the game to be honest, but the game itself had still some exciting secrets to share. 
After you get out of the sewers with Lex, team will rejoin again and you can bring the children to the gate, where you have to use the ID cards which you found in the sewers to open the gate and move on to the next level. As I said, there is no saving possible, but in the end of each level you get a password for the next level which you can use if you want to start with that one in the future. The next level starts with a terminal window which explains a little bit what happened meanwhile and you start in the next level with another creatures and some tasks to do. You need again to search for an ID card and collect some herbs. Once you got the idea the game starts to be repetitive, shoot, run, search and so on, but as soon as I thought that it got boring and finished another level I entered a bunker and was greeted by this. A real 3D level. That was very surprising to see it in the middle of a top-down 2D shoot 'em up game. I was also impressed by the technical implementation. The game had ceiling and floor textures. Also at least some walls were not 90 degrees ang angled. It might sound like a joke, but this was quite a challenge back in 1993. Those features got prominent first with Doom, which was released one month after this Jurassic Park game. Obviously there was a lot of potential hidden in this game, but probably came just a bit unpolished on the market. Aside of the technical aspects, the first 3D level was not too exciting though. Just a short labyrinth with an ele elevator and an exit into the next 2D level, similar to the ones before. However, the 3D part was quite choppy on a 33MHz 486DX, so I decided to give the system an upgrade with a 486DX 266MHz CPU, do some tests and continue the game later. By the way, I forgot to mention that I also previously inserted two RAM modules, 4 MB each, which was added together with onboard 4 MB to 12 MB total RAM. That should be more than enough for a 486. So I dropped the new CPU into the socket and ran some usual tests. Doom finished the benchmark with 3290 points, or about 22 FPS, not great for a 486DX266, but also not super bad for a CPU without a cache. So I added 128k of level 2 cache, repeated the Doom benchmark and got 1 FPS less. The whole system felt a bit slower. And my first thought was, OMG, not again the turbo issue. If you remember the damaged PAL for turbo control, which I reverse engineered, used cache and validation signals to slow down the CPU and I thought that there is something bad about it again. I checked the cache check utility and could clearly see the problem. Without cache the memory throughput was at 25.6 MB per second, but with cache installed it dropped massively to 13.9 MB per second. Well, level 2 cache of course was still faster, but it was not able to compensate such a huge performance drop in the memory throughput. Dependent from the software and if it relies more on cache or memory, the system was slightly faster or a lot slower than running completely without level 2 cache. I switched back to the 486DX33 CPU and repeated all the tests with and without the cache and there the situation was the same. I tested some other CPUs and overclocked the DX266 to 80 MHz with no luck. Level 2 cache always halved the memory throughput. I started once again to test and measure various things but couldn't find anything wrong. Eventually I reached out to my wonderful Patreons and one of the members, Magus, provided some links to check, also to an experimental BIOS which I tried but they didn't help either. However. Among others, there was one link to an old forum about Packard Bell 486 upgrades. And there I found multiple reports from back in the days that this mainboard has some kind of bug which affects the memory throughput when level 2 cache is installed. Multiple people reported that with level 2 installed, the computer became very slow and the only one solution was not to install level 2 cache at all. That was a shame and relief simultaneously. Shame, 
that after so much work this machine cannot become my perfect 486. Relief, because there is no damage on this board which I overlooked. As I mentioned in the beginning of this series, this was the first time that I saw this ACC micro chipset. It seemed to be rare and obviously not without a reason. What a shame. Anyway, the machine was done. I overclocked my DX266 to 80 MHz, installed a fan and continued to play some games. Overall performance was around 15% slower than an average 486 with the same clock and level 2 cache properly working. A bummer, but not terrible. That 15% wouldn't magically make a game run fast enough if it was not playable before. In absolute numbers, for example, if a game ran with, let's say, 15 FPS without level 2 cache, with it installed and 15% higher performance, the game would run then at about 17 FPS. Of course, it's better, but not really an experience changer. Anyway, of course, I came back to Jurassic Park game and continued a journey. After some more 2D levels, I finally reached one 3D level again. This was inspired from the movie, and I was even greeted by the couple of people from the film, saying that the main power circuit is broken and that I have to go and repair it. I had again to find a way through the maze and once more I was surprised to see some non-90 degrees walls. The gameplay itself might be not very interesting here, but I was a game developer in the 90s and was very much interested in such technology. Hence I am so amazed that this game passed by completely unnoticed by myself. It was very exciting to rediscover it on point 30 years later. My respect to the developers. You can see in the game how they've been trying to make something outstanding but eventually probably had to make some shortcuts in 2D. Well, and after some searching I eventually even met some enemies to shoot. Later the dark maze ended and I found myself outside where even more enemies and jobs had to be finished. But this is a story for another day. This build was a lot of ups and downs. The main board was heavily damaged, but I could restore it. Even the turbo circuitry runs again thanks to reverse engineering of the PAL. Quite a bummer was that level 2 cache spoils the memory throughput on this board and makes it practically useless. On the other hand, with the DX2 CPU and the onboard VLB graphics card, the usual 486 games ran flawlessly. I even had some fun with the innovative Jurassic Park game, which was supplied originally by Packard Bell with this machine. Also on the good side, that all parts are still working. I was glad to see that the sound card worked without any issues and that the rare Panasonic CD-ROM drive was absolutely working too. This is something worth preserving. Unfortunately, the hard drive had gained some bad blocks over the years. But I ran Norton Disk Doctor a couple of times during my usage of this machine and no new bad blocks appeared so far. It will of course not last forever, but the longer the better. All in all, I'm quite happy with the result. An old, yellow and broken PC lives again. The case looks great. As I said, I like how compact it is and though has everything it needs. Floppy drive, CD-ROM drive, three ISA expansion slots, VLB graphics cards on board and more. I put a lot of effort into this machine and there were some questions in the comments. Why am I doing this? This is a boring office PC. First of all, I didn't find it boring. But more important, like with every repair which I do, I learned many new things. About the turbo circuitry, about a chipset, which I never saw before, I improved my skills in soldering and repairing, used a microscope for the first time, I even discovered a game which could surprise me after being 30 years in the void. None of this was wasted time. For me, it's never about what I do, but what I learn from it. And with these words, I would like to thank you all for watching. I hope you like this series and would be glad to see you on my channel again. So far, I wish you all peaceful skies so we all can have a lot of fun repairing and learning. Thank you and goodbye.